Team Fortress 2 has easily one of the most iconic and recognizable casts of unique characters of any first-person shooter game ever created. At its time of release, it was truly the first to have so many playable classes with such distinguished attributes. They each have specific silhouettes, weapons, modes of transportation, strengths, weaknesses, but most importantly, they resemble real people with real personalities and real lives. While many of the key aspects of the TF2 character lore have been discussed to death, I'm still surprised to see nobody has bothered to talk about the elephant in the room. What are the TF2 class's favorite metal albums? Using information withdrawn from leaked emails between the TF2 mercenaries and a convoluted imbroglio of my own prophetic visions and nightmares, I am excited to reveal the truth about which metal albums really matter most to the TF2 gang. I'm going to ask you now to drop your own preconceptions at the door, as what you're about to hear may be shocking, but it is the truth. To the uninitiated player, Scout's voice lines may sound like a cacophony of juvenile caffeinated psychosis, but if we listen closely, a pattern reveals itself from out of the fog. You're like a car crash in slow motion. It's like I'm watching you fly through a windshield. In this line, we can inarguably guarantee that the Scout is saying, You're like a car crash in slow motion. It's like I'm watching you fly through a windshield. If what Scout is saying here is true, it means his temporal perception is dramatically different from that of the normal human. Much like how a hummingbird twitches around with absurd agility, it is likely that the Scout's heartbeat runs at an unusually fast beats per minute, giving him a sense of reality that is much slower than that of the other TF2 classes. Considering this, can you really call it a coincidence that the Scout also has the fastest walking movement speed in this game? Because of Scout's altered comprehension of time, he would need to listen to faster music than most just for it to seem normal. Which has to mean one thing. The Scout is a grindcore super fan. And if you yourself are a grindcore super fan, you would immediately know that that means the Scout's favorite metal album has to be The Poacher Diaries. The 1999 split between two bands hailing from Scout's home state of Massachusetts, Agoraphobic Nosebleed and Converge. Agoraphobic Nosebleed, led by Grindcore Hall of Famer Scott Hull, known for his work with Anal Cunt and Pig Destroyer, deliver their classic adrenaline-filled drum machine cyber grind sound on this split while Converge mixed together grind influences with math and metalcore. Because of this release, Scout frequently cites Converge as his favorite band, even though he tends to only make it through the first six tracks of the album before getting distracted, rarely reaching the Converge side of the release. It definitely would make the Scout pretty proud that Converge are a band from essentially Boston. Okay, so compared to many of the other classes, the Soldier, famous for using a rocket launcher and fighting wars without conscription, was easier to pin down as only one album came up in relation to him. But knowing the Soldier's militaristic charisma, you may have thought he would fancy war metal or perhaps power metal. But then you quickly realize the former option has far too much European history, while the latter is even segregated into its EU and US styles a discrimination soldier could easily get behind. It turns out that the war horn that calls to soldier's heart is actually Crimson Glory's debut self-titled album. Here is an excerpt from the soldier's favorite track, Angels of War. It is said that when the soldier first heard this album in 1986, he described it as being so heavy that he hated it. But he eventually warmed up to the band after he was bullied by Scout about it being pansy music. According to an anonymous source, it is also the only album the soldier has ever listened to.
moving on to the Pyro, who is no doubt the most mysterious class in Team Fortress 2. Are they a boy? Are they a girl? Are they even human? Earlier this year, while I was doing my research, I found a suspicious review on AllMusic.com that could only mean one thing. Hey, that's the Pyro. And what album was it that this Pyro was praising? It's the newest offering from the extremely unorthodox instrumental band Behold the Arctopus, titled Hapoleptic Overdrive. Similar to the Pyro, Behold the Arctopus have been subject to a tremendous amount of criticism and are seen by many as a complete departure from the core essence of music. But these mad scientists of technical dissonance weren't phased at all by any haters and upped the ante again in 2020 with their most ambitious offering yet. Despite growing up on traditional Scottish folk music, once the demo man's overindulged in alcoholism set in, he needed something with the same loud offensive tone as a bagpipe, but with an overall more punishing, chaotic atmosphere that could cut through the numbness of even the most severe intoxication which drunkenly teeters on the edge of unconsciousness. With enough searching for the craziest, loudest shit that exists, and little interest in venturing outside of his national pride, he fumbled into the Scottish math core masterpiece Orange Mathematics by Frontier. Right Much like the music itself, the album cover was daunting enough to grab the attention of a seldom sober explosives expert. Now, when it comes to the heavy, you were probably thinking, hey, if the scout loves grinding fast shit and the scout is so fast, then the heavy, who is so slow, has to enjoy really slow shit. Like, give this guy some drone metal and call it a day. But wait one minute, not so fast. Could there be a niche subgenre dedicated to slow, groovy sections that has a lyrical fixation on perverse violence with a strong current of lovable bands spawning from Russia? Of course, it's slam death metal. Now, when most people think of Russian slamming brutal death metal, they surely think of abominable putridity or catalepsy, but the heavy is a more discerning consumer of slam than you'd expect, and craves an even rawer sound without that plasticky coating of modern production that will only hamper the power of the grossest and slowest caveman riffs. For the heavy weapons guy, there is nothing better than the 2013 promo by Russia's own Decomposition of Entrails. The yin-yang balance of the two tracks, orgasm received by ultra-sophisticated torture, and the much slower obsession to gut bitches, will always put a smile to the heavy's face while he mows down his enemies. So if you've seen Meet the Engineer, you might have assumed that the engineer's favorite style of music is probably country or folk. But you're wrong. I even asked him myself. I tend to prefer bands and music that deals with machines and not philosophy. And what album could be more machine-like than Meshuggah's Catch-33? It also doesn't deal with philosophy so long as you don't read the lyrics. Meshuggah just might be the world's most successful and prolific band to be famous for playing really difficult to remember sequences of rhythms that are also surprisingly easy to groove to. And Catch 33 is easily their most cold, mechanical, and experimental release, made for the engineer himself. It's also the only one where the drums were sequenced in a computer rather than performed by Thomas. Throughout the years, Medic and Heavy have done a lot of tape trading and been introduced to many new bands through each other. The Medic's favorite album was a recommendation by Heavy, the one and only album by spastic and technical gore grinders Apisepsy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Lyrical themes like amputated smashed limbs and the smell of singed flesh were enough to reel the medic into embracing apisepsy's over-the-top brutal sound. The Sniper, while born in New Zealand, has spent most of his life in the Australian outback, a scalding environment which is hardly friendly to a human being. It's difficult to say what is really going on with this sniper when he has chosen a life of extreme self-seclusion, huh? Some fan theorists suggested, hey, the sniper's in Australia. Maybe he's listening to some notable Australian metal bands like Carnivool or Stryborg. or the Berserker. And you're right, but he's not listening to those Australian bands mm -hmm. because the Sniper craves music that imbues itself with the spirit of the wilderness that he has called home, which is a tall order that of course can only be met by the Australian funeral doom masterminds known as Mournful Congregation. Amidst the intoxicating, lonely nothingness of life, Sniper can find appeasement in the solitude of their 1995 demo, An Epic Dream of Desire. Last but not least is the spy, the enigmatic, shape-shifting, womanizing serial killer whose role in the game is probably the least like the others. Based on his well-mannered tendencies, his regal charm, and the fact that this album had scantily clad women on the cover, I surmise that the spy's favorite metal album was Carpe Diem by French power metal band Heavenly. But no, his operations were more secretive than even I expected. Carpe Diem was only his second favorite metal album. I had to look for something more obscure, something more unexpected, something more French. And there it was, Anthology 4, The Tragedy of Narak, by avant-garde progressive metal outfit Akphasia. <laughs> And truthfully, Spy would tell you that his real favorite metal album is actually the original 2004 demo version of Exphasia's 2008 album, Anthology 2, which you probably can't find anywhere. And that's the way he likes it. It's his own personal secret. <laughs> 